Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share today, tonight. Uh, missions week, the first uh, week of our missions emphasis. And the thought that came to my mind was this phrase attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, use words if necessary. Well, you know the entire phrase, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. That sounds really nice. There's kind of a warm fuzziness about that. It's like, yeah, I need to be uh, walking and serving and being kind and loving. And, uh, and if I have the chance to say something, oh, okay, I'll do that. It almost sounds like it's more spiritual just to live it than to speak it. Right? It almost sounds like, oh, hey, I'm doing it so I don't have to say anything about it. Well, it's an interesting little phrase because he never said that. Isn't that interesting? It was just attributed to him, but they did some reading about him and study. He never said that. In fact, uh, Francis was quite the preacher. In fact, he is a little bit more like Billy Sunday. Uh, it says that he would sometimes preach up to five villages a day. Often outdoors. In the country, he would often speak from a bale of straw or a granary doorway. In town, he would climb on a box or up steps of a public building. He preached to those who gathered to hear the strange but fiery little words of the preacher of Assisi. So this little phrase attributed to him doesn't really accurately re reflect who he was. Because he was a preacher and he used words all the time. So somebody got a hold of that and says, no, 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 it's better just to do it instead of say anything about it. You can be a silent witness, just calm down with all the speaking part. But can we really calm down with the speaking part? Think about this. It was, what happened? Oop. Sorry, I'm trying to, trying to move it. Can you move it? There you go. I hate to do that all night, but. Uh, Dwayne Lufkin, he was this president at Wheaton College. He said, it's impossible to preach the gospel without words. The gospel is inherently ver verbal. Preaching the gospel is inherently verbal behavior. So we can't get by with just living it and being that silent witness. We have to speak it. That's the gospel. So tonight I want to talk about uh, how do we speak it? So you think about uh, Romans 10. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. There we go. Well, Paul even said, Romans 10, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? Now, you remember your Romans Road verses that we studied. Romans 13, right before this, says, anyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, here it says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one who they not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Somebody has to share the message of the good news. It just doesn't happen. Somebody has to verbally share the news. When we think about Matthew 5.16, we hear this. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So there is the command to see your good deeds so they will glorify your God in heaven. But there is implying that you've told them about why you're doing the good deeds. You've told them about what God has done in your life. So that is a combination. It's both and. It's not either or. It's living it, but it's speaking it as well. So we come to the passage tonight. It's Acts chapter 18. And I'm going to read the passage here and talk about it in detail. So Acts 18, 1 uh, through 11, as I'm going to read. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who recently uh, had come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them from the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Paul came, left Athens and came to Corinth. Everywhere he went, he was preaching the gospel. He would start in the synagogues and preaching with the Jews and telling them about the Christ was to be the Messiah. Here again, they rejected it as they had many, many times and many, many times in the future. They rejected the message. When we think about this uh, passage, he was convinced because of his experience in Christ and how it changed his life, he was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, and he persuaded people, the Jews and the Greeks. He was intent on persuading them. In this passage, though, it says, when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out the clothes in protest and said, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He preached the message that Jesus was the Messiah, and it was rejected, and their response was to heap abuse on him, to insult him, to claim that he is false prophet. And so he says, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to the Gentiles. Interesting, you saw he went right next door. How interesting there. He went to, uh, he left the synagogue, went next door to the house of Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. Right next door. That's almost like McDonald's setting up next to Wendy's, setting up next to Burger King. It's right next door. But didn't you, once you think that would cause a little bit of angst, right? He, he's still there. So Crispus, the synagogue leader, the thing about Crispus was so interesting. He, a Jew, actually believed, and his entire household believed, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So this was a revival in Corinth as Paul came and preached the word. Now, why then that night it says that the Lord came to him in a vision. He spoke to Paul and he said these words. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I'm with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in the city. That's the context for this verse. Many people had just crossed Christ. The Jewish leaders were upset at him, so he, he left. He went next door, and in the night, the Lord says, okay, don't be afraid. So this, this passage is really kind of interesting. So what I found here. There are three commands and three promises. I'm going to link them this way. The first one is, do not be afraid. I'm going to link that with, for I am with you. The next one is, keep on speaking. No one is going to attack and harm you. And the third one I'm going to link, well, I was. Yeah, there it is. Do not be silent because I have many people in this city. Well, let's, let's look at the first one. I, I, you know, I'm, 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 I was good at this, but I'm not really good at this at all. I'm terrible at this. Sorry. I apologize for that. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Think of all the saints in scripture that that phrase has been said to. Every encounter 
with an angel or with a voice from heaven or with the Son of God. It's like, fear not, for I'm with you. When we think about Paul and this experience, you realize he said when he wrote back to the Corinthians, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. I don't really think about Paul in my mind and read about him. I don't, I don't associate him with fear and trembling, right? I associate him with the boldness to stand up and stand before the Roman officials and to preach the gospel. And this doesn't seem like Paul to me, but that was what he said to the Corinthian believers. When I came to you, I came in weakness and great fear and trembling. Why? Well, it's interesting. If you looked at Paul's ministry before he came to Corinth, in Acts 14, he was stoned and left for dead in Lystra. In, Philipp, in Philippi, in Acts 16, he was beaten and imprisoned. Then when you get to Acts 17, he was threatened and run out of town in Thessalonica. And uh, then he went to Berea and the people in Thessalonica came to Berea and caused a riot there. Then he went to Athens where there was, he preached to the God of the unknown on Mars Hill. And then he comes to Corinth. So you can see why he was in fear and trembling, right? I mean, he had been stoned, he'd been beaten, he'd been thrown in jail. He had been run out of town and threatened and run out of town. It's like, okay, I'll give him the fact that you can be afraid and trembling. Especially when he just got done with the synagogue in Corinth and he preached to them and they rejected him and heaped abuse on him. I'm assuming that he was going through his mind saying it's just going to happen in Corinth just like it did in Berea, just like it just did in Thessalonica, just like it did in Philippi, just like it did in Lystra. And so, all right, maybe I'm not going to be very, very long. But the Lord came to him that night and he said, don't be afraid. I am with you. That was the assurance that he had. And so he stayed a year and a half in Corinth and he preached and many people came to Christ because of his faithfulness. You know, when you think about Corinth, here's a quote from someone that did study that even by pagan standards of its own culture, Corinth was a morally corrupt city. In fact, the name Corinth came to be associated with moral debauchery. And if you wanted to insult someone, you'd say you're a Corinthian. Or if you wanted to uh, say that Corinthianize, it represented immorality. So it's very really interesting when Paul wrote to the book of uh, to uh, the church in Rome. He actually wrote from Corinth, and he wrote these words. Now these words, Paul is just talking about the state of the world and the attitude of those in the world, and Paul is. Uh, sharing these thoughts, but he was in Corinth looking around at what he was seeing in Corinth. So let's read these words with that in mind. So I'm in Corinth, I'm looking around, and I'm thinking of things that I'm fighting against. Here's what he said. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served and created other things other than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. <clears throat> because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged the natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust. For one another, men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think of it worthwhile to retain God in the knowledge of God, 
So God gave them over to a depraved mind so they could do what not ought to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Well, that doesn't just describe Corinth. That describes Grand Rapids. That describes the United States. That describes the world. That describes the lost mind those who have nev- not yet been gen- regenerated in Christ, this is how they think. And so when you have fear and trembling, going out to talk to somebody, knowing that this is the background, that they become filled with every kind of weakness, evil, greed, depravity, envy, murder, just strive to see. I mean, it's, it's natural to say, I'm a little bit afraid. I'm a little bit afraid. Well, let's move on. Proverbs says, the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. So when we struggle with sharing our faith with someone else and trying to uh, share the gospel with them and the good news of Jesus Christ, and we're afraid, it's a snare to us. But if you trust in the Lord, Paul said, The Lord said to Paul, do not be afraid, I am with you. Jesus Christ, even in the Great Commission, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So we have his promise. Paul had the promise, we have the promise. He's going to be with you. He's going to give you the words to say. He's going to give you the strength to say them. Well, let's move on to the second one. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one's going to attack and harm me because I have many people in this city. So the second one is, keep on speaking. No one is going to attack and harm you. Well, I appreciate what Pastor Roger preached a couple Sunday nights ago about uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, where he's talking about, the trials that the Thessalonian believers are going through. We know there are people throughout the world who claim the name of Christ, and they're persecuted for it. They struggle because uh, they lose their jobs, they lose their family, they lose their life savings. So it's real, and it's current, and we know it. So this is happened um, August 16. This was in Pakistan in a mob Uh, attack Christian churches and homes, and at least 17 churches and 100 homes are damaged as the mob attacks in Pakistan. Amazing. It just happens all the time. We see this on the news all the time. I have a friend. His name that he told me that I could share is Zorma, kind of an unusual name, but he was hiding behind that name. He lives in a country And he's a pastor, but he serves in another country across the border. So he will will go through the jungle and through crossing the border, and he ministers to people in this restricted country. And that country, uh, there's persecution to Christians. And he, I was on a Zoom call with him. It's a couple months ago, a few months ago, actually. And he was telling me about the persecution that he was facing right now. And he showed me some pictures of uh, churches being burnt down. And he said, I was going to be in that area, but I wasn't able to cross the border. And so I wasn't there when it happened. It was just like real. Here was somebody talking to you right now that was experiencing persecution. And then I looked on Fox News the next day, and there was the same picture that my friend had just showed me. I felt like I was, it was live. I saw it live, and here they were a couple days late with the news, but I talked to the guy who was right there. It's real. Paul said, they will not attack and harm you. Now, how does that work with um, people like Zorma, people like these folks? 
Well, this promise was for Paul for that moment, because obviously Paul before had been persecuted. He'd been thrown in jail and beaten and uh, run out of town. I mean, so, but God gave him a window. He gave him some relief. He gave him a year and a half without being persecuted so he could share the gospel freely. Well, you know what? I mean, we don't live in Pakistan, and we don't live in other closed countries and other countries where there's, we have the freedom to share. There's nothing holding us back except ourselves, right? So he said to us, don't be afraid, for I'm with you. Then he says to us, keep on speaking, keep on speaking. It's interesting, when Paul was thrown into prison, he said, you know, the fact that I'm here, because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and have dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So when we look at the instance in Pakistan or the instance other places or the instance of persecuted churches all over the world, instead of saying, wow, I'm glad it's not me, we need to say, if they can stand up for Christ under that kind of conditions and under that heat of persecution, why not me? Why can't I do it? And this verse says, I need to be more confident in the Lord and dare to all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So, yes, I'm free. I don't have the persecution, but Instead of taking that and building my confidence, I shrink back because I'm afraid. For whatever reason, I'm afraid. Isaiah wrote, he said, I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you fear mere mortals? Human beings were but grass. You know, it puts fear in, in, in perspective, right? What am I afraid of? Why is, why is it so hard to talk? Isaiah goes on to say, that you forget the Lord your master who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth, that you live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor who is bent on destruction. For where is the wrath of the oppressor? Well, obviously, uh, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, and obviously there are places in this world where Christians are persecuted who can't meet like this, who don't have the freedom, who can't talk to their neighbors, to their coworkers, to anybody without the fear of some sort of repercussions. But that's not here. That's not now for us. So what are, what are the reasons here? So why don't we witness I mean, the thing about witnessing is, in our minds, we know we ought to do it, right? There's no debate about that, right? There's, yes, I vote yes. But why? Why don't we do it? Well, I think the first one is fear of rejection. I think we're going to be afraid that somebody might not like us, that they might look down on us. They, they might think we're weird. They might think, well, I, you, oh, so you believe that, so you're like, they put you on sort, sorts of categories, and they make up stuff about how, why you have a bad attitude about all sorts of things. So we're afraid that for whatever reason, we might be rejected by our family. We might be rejected by friends. When you're in high school, you might say, well, I can't speak up for that because all my friends will disown me and turn away. Well, lack of confidence. I don't have a seminary degree, or I didn't go to Bible college, or I, I, I haven't read the Bible in a while, or whatever. We have all sorts of reasons why we can't speak. I love uh, Mapindi's uh, message today. Uh, she was, a woman at the well was instant. <laughs> she didn't have a seminary degree or anything. She just went and spoke and said, he told me everything that I ever did. He is the Messiah. So we, we put barriers in our minds. We say, well, I can't speak because I don't have the education or I don't have the experience or I wouldn't know what to say or I don't know what to answer if they say this and I, I'll be flustered. So the lack of confidence kind of gets us. Another one here is apathy. We just don't care. 
Now, did I say I don't? Did I say that? I, I, I shouldn't. I, sorry, didn't mean to say that. But you know what? I mean, uh, that's really kind of that's. Is it that I don't care that I'm just so busy? Right? I'm busy, busy doing other things that are important things. But I make time for the things that I want to think they're important. So really, it's apathy. That hurts. So, so now I quit preaching, and I went to ben- meddling, right? So I, I moved in that direction. Didn't, didn't mean to do that. Sorry. But I think that's true, that I don't know that I really care that much. I don't know that I really have in my mind that these folks who, if they continue to reject Christ, they're facing a Christless eternity. Ooh, that's hard. Another one is confusion about the gospel. I don't know if I know what to say. What's the right order? I know the Romans wrote, kind of. I thank you for the evangelism committee that took us through the various verses that we needed to memorize and helped us think through that process. But uh, when I get into the heat of the conversation, then it all floods away, and I just kind of, I kind of fumble for my words. You feel that way? You feel like, yeah, I, just, I know what I should say, but I don't know that I should say it at the right time. I struggle with that. Lack of opportunities, right? So this is a big one, really. Oh, sorry. Oh, my. So... So user error is the problem here, I think. It's not, it's not Doug. Don't blame Doug. It's not him. Is it? I don't think so. Lack of opportunities. You know, it's great to live in Grand Rapids, right? Because a church on every corner, a Christian school in every, you know, everywhere you talk to, it's Christians, Christians everywhere, everywhere you look. That's great. So one of the lack of opportunities is you might not have any unsafe friends. You might not know any unsafe people. Is that possible? Yeah, I think it is. I think we run in our circle. We have our cluster, our cluster of people, and it's hard to break out. you got to really force yourself to break out and go to find somebody that doesn't know Jesus because everybody knows Jesus. But you have to really have an intentional effort to share the gospel. Here's our verse again. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I'm with you. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So my third one, do not be silent because I have many people in this city. It's kind of interesting. Um, Youth for Christ here in Grand Rapids says that in West Michigan, there are 120,000 young people ages 15 to 19. 120,000. 70,000 of them don't have a church or a gospel influence in their life. 70,000 young people ages 15 to 19 don't know Christ from their calculations. And then they would say, and a third of those would call themselves atheists. The harvest is ripe. I mean, there are people in our town, there are neighbors that we know that they don't know Christ. We just need to open our eyes. Do not be silent. Jeremiah said, but if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then my heart It becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. Oh, I wish this was my verse and your verse, that I cannot be silent. I wish that. I wish that's the case. That the word of God is in my heart, and it's burning. It's shut up in my bones. I got to say something. That was the woman at the well today. She had to say something. She couldn't. She couldn't keep quiet. She had to go back into town and tell everybody. And then Jesus said, look, lift your eyes. See the harvest. It's coming. You know, he was talking about all those people coming out to see him and hear of the Messiah. So let me give you some encouragement. Using words is necessary, despite what somebody thinks that Francis of Assisi said. 
So what do I do? If I want to share the gospel, I want to be an evangelist. I want to share the good news. I know I need to, and I don't want to guilt myself, but I want to, I want to do it. All right, so what do I do? I think the first one is you need to pray for opportunities. So <clears throat> Paul said, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Oh, I love that. I think that's great. And it's great to know, he says, I, I came in fear and trembling. And now he says, I want to fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. But he says, hey, I need the opportunity. So if you don't have an opportunity or you haven't had one, pray that the God will bring you a divine appointment and bring somebody into your life that you can share a word of truth. So I traveled quite a bit. I was in the Phoenix airport. And I was uh, in a new terminal. They hadn't really opened it up. And, you know, it was one of these things where there I was, I, I needed to make a phone call. I needed to find a quiet place. And so I found this two chairs in this big room with no other chairs anywhere, just two chairs. And I went and I had my phone call. And it was a conversation with the guys at the Jesus film. And we were talking about their fundraising need. And I was talking about strategy and stuff like that. And this woman came and sat down by me, and she heard like 20 minutes of my conversation. And usually when I'm with a client, when I um, end, I pray with them, and we just pray for God's blessing, that he'd open the right doors, that he'd give them wisdom as they seek to raise some money. And I hung up with them, and this lady said to me, she was about 40 or so, she says, it must be wonderful to have Christian brothers that you can share and pray with. I said, yeah, it's great. Are, do you, are you a believer? No. Uh, so then all of a sudden, we had this conversation. All of a sudden, I said, well, have you, do you know, have you heard the gospel message? She said, yeah, I know it all. I, I've been in church, but uh, I don't, I'm, she said, I'm a runner. I thought, are you a track star? What, are you a jogger? What, what do you, I'm a runner. I'm running away from God. Wow. I mean, <laughs> what do you say? What do you say at that moment? I said, well, you know what? Um, you remember the prodigal son? He was a runner too. And he ran away. But then he ran back. And God received him with open arms. He needed to run back. You know, it was one of these God moments. And she took that and listened to it. And then, of course, time ran out, and she had to catch a flight. I had to catch a flight. But I had a chance just to say a word. And the, the Holy Spirit gave me the words to say at that moment. He provided that divine appointment. And it's like, wow. Could I have said more? Yeah, sure. Did I say enough? Don't know. Will the God use it? Absolutely because he appointed that moment. So pray for opportunities. Prepare for answers. You're going to have all sorts of questions about why you believe what you believe. You don't have to know all the, inst uh, the theological stuff. You don't have to know all the arguments about creation. You don't have to know all the, you know, I don't want to say it this way. You don't have to know the Heidelberg uh, Catechism, but I, no, I didn't mean to say that. But because you do. I'm sorry. You have to know that. Other than that, you're fine. But, you know, you don't have to know everything. But you need to prepare. You need to do the best to prepare. So here it is, 1 Peter 3, 1. But in your hearts, revere Christ as the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. That is a verse that requires preparation and steady, right? Always be ready. Always be prepared. That's like the Boy Scout verse, right? Always be prepared to give an answer. Now, what am I giving an answer? I'm giving an answer for the hope that I have. I'm, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I'm, I'm sharing a hope I have in Christ. And I want people to have the same hope 
because they're lost and they're looking for answers and they know that you have an answer because your life is different and they want to know why you're different. And so you need to be ready to say, well, it's not because I have great parents or not, not because I went to this great Christian school or it's not because I live in this great neighborhood. It's because Jesus saved my life from a life of sin. Be ready. Always be ready. Another one here, be authentic. Paul wrote to the Philippians, and this is my prayer that your love may abound. Oops, sorry. User error, sorry. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of the Lord. So you need to be authentic. The pure and blameless in your King James, you remember that from uh, your memory verses from years ago. So it was like sincere is the word for pure. Sincere is, the Greek word, is a word that means, sincere means without wax. And so what would happen is that potters would throw their pot, really fun watching them make a pot, but then if it would crack... They didn't just, some of them didn't throw it out. What they would do, they would melt wax in the cracks and kind of make do with it. Make it, paint it. We're going to paint it anyway, so it'll be fine. And so you, you, you buy this beautiful um, uh, vase and you take it home and it, it looks great until you put water in it and then it leaks. And it's like, wow. What? So the sincere is without wax, without wax. So what uh, uh, some, uh, somebody's buying pottery would do is they take that pottery and hold it up to the light and if it wasn't, if you didn't see the cracks because there was no wax, then it was sincere. It was pure. The Lord wants you to be authentic. Now, one thing that holds us back from witnessing is we're sinners and we know it and we need to deal with the sin in our lives first, right? I mean, because I want to be pure and blameless because I can't talk to somebody unless I've I got sin in my life. So, But instead of hanging on to the sin, we need to confess it and be pure and blameless. Last one, be loving and compassionate. Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I mean, there's so many, uh, so many news news items today that's just i i watch people struggle with sin and it just breaks your heart because of all the issues that are going on all the people that are all sorts of messed up in this world and instead of being judgmental on them we need to have compassion on them because they're confused and they need the gospel one more here ask the holy spirit for words right so you might not be uh, good with words. You might stumble over your words. You might struggle with knowing what to say. So this is a great verse. I love this one. So it's Matthew 10, 19, and 20. I just love this verse. So Jesus said, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say where, because it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Oh, I love that. It's just so great. Because I always worry about what to say and how to say it. All the time. But it says, hey, the Lord says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. Because at that time, you will be given what to say. So think about the opportunities you have to share the gospel with somebody. And, yeah, we need to prepare. We need to memorize. We need to, you know, work through it so you have the things you should say. But don't freeze up at the moment because it says, it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. That's powerful. Because then... I'm not responsible for the outcome, right? It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's his. It's his job. And, and I, I can trust in that. I can wait on that. It's such a blessing. So here's something interesting. So we read the first about Romans, about 
all the wickedness of the world that Paul saw as he looked around Corinth and wrote that to Romans. Here's what he wrote back later in 1 Corinthians. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, that's a, wow, that's a tough, that's a tough verse, but that's gospel. And then Paul says, and that is what some of you were. That's fantastic. When Paul went to Corinth, he dealt with all the people in that previous verse. But he shared the gospel with them. It says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what some of you were. Wow. That should give us confidence to share the gospel because the Holy Spirit transforms lives. He changes lives. Yeah, they could be all those former things. Yeah, they are all those former things. But when Christ comes to your life, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does it. It's not you, but God's using you. So here's your assignment. I want you to go watch YouTube. Had a crazy assignment? I don't know if you've ever heard of Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort is an evangelist in California. He goes out and he goes to Huntington Beach and he will interview people and he'll share the gospel with them. I've been watching this religiously for a year. This guy is amazing. And when you watch it, you're going to be shocked at how bold he is because he'll actually use that previous verse as he talks with people. Because his his strategy is to help them realize they're lost and they're on their way to hell before they realize they need the Savior and need to trust Jesus. So it's shocking as he shares conversations with him. And he's really, he's bold. He's so bold. I want you to watch one of them. So it's a YouTube channel. It's called Ray Comfort, and it's called Just Witnessing. And watch one of them. I was going to show one tonight, but I knew it was going to be too long. So uh, that's your assignment. And I think you'll just be excited. And the thing that's so exciting is if you watch them long enough, then there's somebody who will trust Christ. And it's just, it's just, you just can't, it's just, I, I don't have words for it. It's such a wonderful experience. People who struggle with being an atheist and whatever, and then he shares the gospel, and, and then he says, can I pray with you? Yes. And the transformation that comes, you'll, you'll be blessed. I just want to encourage you to uh, take a little time, and you'll love that. So here's the verse. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one's going to attack and harm me because I have many people in this city. Let's pray. Father, forgive us. We are afraid. We know the right things to say that we should say. But we let our fear keep us from speaking. Forgive us for that. And I want to pray that you would bring a revival in our hearts that we'd be so excited about sharing the gospel that we couldn't we won't be silent. But Lord, uh, forgive us. Lord, we have so many other things to talk about. There's the weather, of course, and there's football, and there's uh, our kids, and there's the beach and camping. And just, Lord, there's just so many things we can talk about. Help us to talk about Jesus. Forgive us when we don't. But give us the courage to do it. I thank you for these friends, how much they love you, how much they want to serve you. I thank you for this church and just all the many evangelism events we attempt and we try and we do. We just, but Lord... Help us not just to do the works, but help us to say the words. Because we know that's how people come to know the Savior. Bless us now. We need your grace. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen.